Before Peter Kent went to um, the conference, there were all sorts of reports that Canada, the government, planned to pull out of Kyoto. Um, you know, he wouldn't kind of verify that, but that's what's happened. So, um, are you surprised since it's been, you know, uh, yeah. talked about for weeks? Well, the CTV uh, Evening News, Roger Smith's report, uh, just as Kyoto was about to open, was clearly um, not a plant by this government because if it, had been a, if it had been a planted news story, the pattern, which they do plant news stories, their pattern is then to, to confirm it later. Uh, Peter Kent's discomfiture with the question was clear when he did scrums before leaving for Durban, in which after a very lengthy pause he managed to say, today is not the day. Obviously yesterday was the day. They were waiting till the COP17 was over. Uh, my analysis of this is that Canada wanted to do the maximum amount of damage to the future agreements in which we would not participate. That our role in Kyoto as a saboteur was more effective if we were there dodging the essential question, is it true that you plan to legally withdraw from Kyoto? Uh, having heard the CTV news story that night, I checked as much as I could and my sense was that this was true that in fact the Harper cabinet, which really means Stephen Harper personally, had decided to legally withdraw from Kyoto and I recognize being familiar with the legalities of the Kyoto Protocol that to legally withdraw Canada must give notice one year before the end of the first commitment period which meant that our deadline for serving a legal notice was December 31st 2011. Knowing that was decided I still worked as hard as I could to persuade the Environment Minister not to do it, not to go through with it that this would be devastating for our reputation internationally, that it would be seen, and we will be seen, as a country that deals in bad faith. I mean, these early comments from Tuvalu and China, I imagine as the word gets out, there will be commentary from other nations and whether countries are prepared to be undiplomatic in their language or not. How will the EU negotiators looking across the table at Canada in negotiations on a comprehensive economic trade agreement, how, how concerned will they be that this is a country that cares nothing for legally binding targets and commitments. Why will it make a difference that this was Kyoto and climate change doesn't matter this Prime Minister, but trade does? So I, I was surprised that the idea came forward in the first place. I was shocked, I was horrified, and I have to say that for the last number of weeks since that CTV report came out, I've been hoping against hope that it would not happen that there would be, after two weeks in Durban, that the Environment Minister would come back and say to his boss, look, it's not going to wash. The world just moved to a second commitment period under Kyoto. It's not dead. It's still going. Important trading partners of ours, the, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, other countries in the developing world, particularly China, demand a second commitment period under Kyoto. And for us to legally withdraw will do us damage. And it's the wrong thing to do. Obviously, if that conversation happened, and I doubt there was time between when Peter Kent landed and when he made the announcement to withdraw, but if he made any attempt to change the Prime Minister's mind, it didn't work. I have to say, no matter how much one has heard about it in a period of two weeks before the announcement was made, it's nonetheless devastating. So, when Peter uh, Kent, and he repeats this over and over again, that Canada <coughs> produces less than 2% of emissions, the big emitters, China and India, aren't in Kyoto, don't you think that resonates with Canadians? Sure it resonates with Canadians. It's probably the result of focus group testing. It's just not true. That's the problem with their spin. China, India, Brazil are all parties to the Kyoto Protocol. And the first phase of Kyoto, just as the first phase of the Montreal Protocol on ozone, was designed for the industrialized countries to go first. That's the part Stephen Harper's never liked. That's why he referred to it as a socialist scheme back when he was leader of the Alliance Party. It requires industrialized countries to go first. And with this, the theory, which worked on ozone depletion, that being wealthier, having greater access to technology, and also being responsible for the creation of the problem in a way that developing countries were not, and this is true to this day, the, you know, the 90 percent of what we're dealing with in terms of climate crisis is due to industrialized country emissions, not China. The fact that China has now overtaken the United States as the world's biggest polluter means we have to get hold of China's emissions as well. But we're dealing with a climate crisis created by decades of loading the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. And the, the uh, impact of what's happening in the atmosphere right now is not something that you can say, oh, well, Canada's emissions were, are only 2%. Canada's emissions per capita are enormous. They're about the largest in the world. And on top of that, the 2% that we represent of emissions, sadly, 
we are more than 2% of the problem in global negotiations. We have blocked, we have obstructed, we, we are Canada's repudiation of Kyoto in 2006, when Harper first became Prime Minister, was a serious blow to progress. And the negotiations between 2006 and today have at every single meeting, Canada has been the worst country in the room, the most obstructionist, the most unhelpful. So we have worked to sabotage Kyoto, and then we stand back and say, see, it didn't work. One of the reasons it didn't work was we were getting under the hood and pulling out the spark plugs. You know, if the, if the Montreal Protocol on Ozone had ever had the kind of sabotage visited on it by Kyoto, it wouldn't have worked either. It's not the flaw of the agreement. It's the lack of political will, the cowardice of countries that are more afraid of the oil lobby than they are interested in protecting their children's future. Um, you've been at this for a long time, going back to working for Lucien Bouchard in the Environment Department, so it's been years. Yeah. How would you describe how you feel about things now, and what do you see for the environment? This is no longer an environmental issue. In a lot of ways, it never was. In 1986, when I, it was actually Tom McMillan, I was senior policy advisor and learned from Environment Canada scientists, not what they regarded as a theory, but what they saw happening. They said, look, here are the climate models. If we keep loading greenhouse gases into the environment, into the atmosphere, we're going to see warming. And that warming could, and I can remember this crystal clear, that in 1986 or 87, when ministers, scientists from Environment Canada were advising us, it would say, if we don't do something, we could start seeing the retreat of glaciers in Canada. We could start seeing the loss of Arctic ice by 2030. So the models tend over time to be, have been shown to have been conservative in their estimates, have, have been wrong largely because of two things. One is it's very hard to anticipate how fast emissions of greenhouse gases were going to continue to rise. They shot up in the 90s. They went up, and every year on, they've gotten larger and larger. The other reason that the modeling underestimated the damage was that we didn't anticipate positive feedback loops. Positive feedback loops are our biggest threat right now, that we will emit so many greenhouse gases as an industrialized society globally that we will push past tipping points, thresholds in the atmosphere, at which point these positive feedback loops will take over and run a self-accelerating global warming process which humanity is helpless to stop. Positive feedback loops, just in a nutshell, are such things as as the Arctic ice shrinks, we lose the effect of the white ice bouncing the sun back to space, so as more dark water is exposed, it sucks in the heat from the sun and melts ice faster. Permafrost melting. Every time the permafrost melts, it releases what was trapped, frozen in, in old muskeg, release, releases methane gas, which is a warming gas which further heats the atmosphere. The last science, just about a week ago, was that if all of the permafrost on the planet were to melt, it would release warming gases in the form of methane four times larger than all the greenhouse gases emitted by human activity since before the Industrial Revolution. In other words, game over for planet Earth. There's no economy on Venus, by the way. You can check. There are risks here that go beyond our ability to adapt, no matter how rich you are, no matter what country you live in. If we let this run to global warming in a runaway war global warming scenario, we are not talking about the survival of the planet. Now, I hope that's, a, that's the end point of the very worst case, but we've got to get a handle on reducing greenhouse gases fast. And as I said, how do I feel? We, in the beginning when I worked on this issue, in the, the mid-80s through the 90s, kept thinking, we've got time. We've got some time. We maybe have a decade to turn this around. Maybe we've got, you know, you'll try to estimate when we have. The International Energy Agency, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the scientific community, NASA, they're all really clear on this. We don't have any time. We have to ensure that greenhouse gases stop rising globally by 2015 and start coming down from there, which is why the Durban agreements were inadequate and which is why we need accelerated commitments to reduce greenhouse gases. Not a wealthy, industrialized country like Canada dealing a blow like this when we're running out of time. Have we actually given up? No, God, how can one give up? I, you, I mean, I'm a mother. I've got grandchildren. Giving up is like saying to your kids, I'm sorry I tried, kids, but you're heading for hell in a handbasket. But, you know, good luck with it. It's a moral obligation of our generation not to give up. And we still have time. That's the other side of this. We still have time. But the Harper government has just sabotaged an important, albeit small, 
bit of progress in Durban because that agreement was fragile and it had two elements that go hand in hand. Second commitment period under Kyoto, long-term strategy with, with targets that are way too far in the future. I mean, when you, when you identify the science that we must reduce greenhouse gases and ensure they stop rising no later than 2015, and that's the global picture. No rise in emissions after 2015, a freeze at that point. Now, that's not a target to reducing below a certain amount by any time. This is just, we have to get a handle on this. We have to stop emissions rising and start the trajectory towards transiting off of fossil fuels. It is still doable. The world agencies that look at this, whether it's the OECD or the International Energy Agency or the IPCC, identify some really important first steps. One, stop subsidizing fossil fuels. Two, put a price on carbon. Those are essential steps, and if they were taken globally, we'd be all right. And when you look at a country like Sweden that put a carbon tax in place, reduced greenhouse gases to 20% below 1990 levels, and in the period in which they did that, saw their economy grow by 40%, then we know that it's clearly not true that this is a choice between the environment and the economy. This is a choice between the survival of human civilization and short-term profits for the oil companies. Guess which one most Canadians would choose? as uh, in violation of domestic law? Yes, the Kyoto Implementation Act requires of Canada that we meet our obligations under Kyoto. There's a misinterpretation of this that's possible by saying, well, the obligations are only 2008 to 2012. That's the first commitment period for targets. But the Kyoto Protocol is more than the industrialized country targets. As I said, it's a framework of laws including monitoring, reporting, transparency about our emissions. Uh, if we abandon, as they plan to do, the Kyoto Protocol, what of our domestic legislation? Will they repeal it? What will happen with Canada's obligations to monitor? As climate science is cut, as monitoring is cut, do we plan to stop reporting on what's happening? That would be, I think, consistent with what we've seen in other areas. Is this one of the, I mean, since there's no truth whatsoever to the idea that staying in Kyoto would cost Canada penalties, there aren't any effective penalties or enforcement mechanisms under Kyoto. So that's, that's a, that is one of the most bogus things I've ever heard any government minister say. It was, it was, it would have been laughable except that this is tragic. So uh, it, it's completely untrue that we would risk a dime. So what could be their motivation? Well, one is just the ideologically driven uh, reality that Stephen Harper personally hates Kyoto. It doesn't have to be reasonable, it doesn't have to have a logic to it, he just hates it. Or it could be that there's a logic and they want out from reporting requirements. They don't want to have to continue to report our emissions, continue to have monitoring, continue to allow countries around the world to see what we're doing. I mean, it was very uh, uh, poignant that during COP17, having had the Jocelyn Mine proposal for expansion of a tar sands, for a brand new tar sands mine, and of an enormous new mine, uh, on their desk in cabinet for 10 months. They chose during COP17 to announce a new tar sands project. So it, it, the message to the rest of the world is pretty clear. Uh, Canada doesn't give a damn. As an MP, parliamentarian, mm -hmm. what's your next step? Well, I'm hoping still to see if we can have, uh, the opposition parties are clearly all uh, unhappy with this decision, to put it mildly. Uh, you know, I've worked on this issue longer than anyone else in the House, but that doesn't mean there aren't other MPs and other parties who don't appreciate how significant this is and how important it is that we oppose it. Now, taking a step back from this, what can Canadians do, what can we do? Bear in mind, we filed a letter for legal intent to withdraw. Doesn't take effect for a year. We can still withdraw the letter saying we legally intend to withdraw. What we've done is they've covered their bases. They want us to think it's over. It's clear. I mean, how many times can Peter Kent say Kyoto's in the past? Right? Kyoto is not dead. It's not in the past. It's not in Canada's past. A hundred and, I don't know, 180 countries around the world just wanted in every minister's statement that we heard on the floor of the plenary a second commitment period under Kyoto. So Canada's place here is one that's... Uh, significantly isolated and, and uh, discredited. So we've got a year to convince the Prime Minister to change his position on this. He doesn't change his position very easily or very often, but if there's one thing that will, it's if they discover conservative voters aren't happy. They discover the conservative voters are also grandmothers who sometimes think 
this isn't the kind of world I want to leave my kids. And there are a lot of us out there. And I know from my own riding how many conservatives voted green because I said, you know, I've started thinking about it. What else matters but my kids' future? We have to reach those people. We have to talk to the people who have already always felt that climate mattered and encourage them not to give up. The worst thing that could happen right now would be if all the people who understand how important climate is decide there's nothing you can do because we effectively have an elected dictatorship, so what's the point? The point is we have a parliament. We have a democracy. And all of us as parliamentarians have rights and obligations. We are all equal in the House of Commons, at least in theory. And there's no way in this world that I'm going to surrender my kids' future because of a political process that elects a government with a minority of the votes in this country. We have to mobilize. We have to get people talking to individual conservative MPs of conscience, asking them to step up, asking them to raise questions in caucus. We have a year to make sure Canada does not legally withdraw from Kyoto. And that's something to which I think we can all, as parliamentarians in the opposition party, find ways in the coming year. And as activists across the country and environmental groups across the country, and I know people are despairing, and I know people are are weeping across this country. I'm getting emails and notes and letters and phone calls. All I can say is, dry your tears, don't give up, get up and fight. Because it's our kids' future. There's nothing more important to fight for. Where billion come from? Thin air, imagination. It's uh, probably, if you were, the, the theory under which they're operating is that somehow we would be obliged to meet our Kyoto target of 6% below 1990 levels by 2012 having ignored the target and allowed greenhouse gas levels to rise and having no plan to do so, if you wanted to reach your Kyoto target with a one-year stop-start program from here to there, you could buy emission credits. And you could buy pollution credits from other countries that reduced their emissions. And you could you know, peg the price of carbon and multiply. I think it might be more than $14 billion. But nobody in their right mind would do that. No one's expecting Canada to do that. And more to the point, the Kyoto Protocol cannot require Canada to do that. Kyoto Protocol and the parties to Kyoto Protocol would like one thing. They'd like Canada to be responsible, to come back to the negotiating table, and to say, OK, in the second commitment period, our target is 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. That's what we've said publicly. I'm now speaking as if I were the Harper government. But we need you to take account for, this is the one enforcement mechanism in Kyoto, the one penalty is, if you negotiate a second commitment period target, for each ton that you agree to reduce in the second commitment period, there's a top up of an additional 0.3 of a ton added to whatever you negotiate. So clearly, if you want to be a good negotiator, you go in and say, all right, for Canada to get back to the table, which all countries around the world, industrialized and developing, really would like, this is what we need from you. We're going to negotiate a target that's going to be way above what we were supposed to do in the first commitment period under Kyoto, but we will make it legally binding. We'll get in with you guys, but we're going to need it to be 5% above 1990 levels by 2020. It's an appalling target, but frankly, it's better than no legal commitment and no real target at all. And the fact that the Harper spin machine has managed to present this as though Canada was unhappy with Kyoto because it didn't do enough for the climate, let's be clear. The Harper government is unhappy with Kyoto because it does something for the climate, and this government is absolutely unequivocally committed to expanding the oil sands. And their only interest in climate change is managing it from a public relations point of view so Canadians don't realize exactly how destructive and irresponsible this government really is. Sure. Yeah. About the reporting, you said maybe they don't want to report. Do you feel that's because they don't want to be embarrassed or what? There could be a number of explanations. It, you know, any time that you have to report what you're doing uh, globally, and, and bear in mind that the Commissioner for Environment and Development, in his report that came out in early October, uh, the Commissioner for Environment and Sustainability within the Auditor General's Department, Scott Vaughan, in that report, and I think it was October 4th, made note of the fact that he believed that Canada was already uh, violating the domestic law, the Kyoto Implementation Act, because we weren't sufficiently reporting. So we already know this from the Auditor General's office. This government has a problem with reporting its greenhouse gas emissions. And being liberated from that obligation is something they might like. Just because they don't like doing it, maybe because it costs something, and also because I can't, I've, I've said this before, I can't 
find a single scientist in this country who is knowledgeable on the climate issue, whether in government or in academia, who has ever briefed the prime minister. So I don't think he has, I mean, I think a responsibility of leadership, a responsibility of a prime minister, is to at least try to understand an issue you don't get. To understand that climate science is real, that the warnings of science have an immediate, clear and present danger kind of a warning that you're irresponsible to ignore. He sees climate change and even climate science as a leftist agenda. This is unique to Canada. Look at the UK, where when uh, Tony Blair and Labour were replaced by David Cameron and the Conservatives, they stayed right on track on climate action. They stayed on track on climate spending in the face of the economic downturns of the UK. They're closing hospitals in preference to making sure that they stay to their climate targets. That's a level of resolve from a conservative government. This is not a left-right issue. This should not be a partisan issue. This is an issue of whether you understand science and you're prepared to act or whether you're irresponsible. And Mr. Harper is irresponsible. Thank you so much for his attention.